Hey, Dream Chasers, this is Amy J, and thank you guys so much for tuning in to episode 227 of Chasing Dreams. Guys, I know the world is going crazy right now. Things are wild. COVID is still running rampant. Uh, quality is being questioned. Well, it shouldn't be questioned. It, it is a thing. It's a, it's a problem right now. And so um, when you're doing all that, what can you do? And so I wanted to bring someone who would talk about authenticity authenticity because it's so important nowadays um, not just in the corporate world you know with businesses your employers etc but with you as a person to be authentic and so I am bringing on a friend of mine who when I met we just clicked there was a connection there and she not only talked the talk about being authentic and its importance but she walks the walk and so Erin Hatsakostas is amazing she spent half her career in the corporate world, and at the age of 42, she was the CEO of a $2 billion healthcare financial institution. Then, when things were on the upswing still, she walked away because she wanted to talk about the immense lack of authenticity in happiness in corporate America. That's crazy, right? But it's true and authentic to what she was doing. And so anyone who can do that, walk away and, and talk about a message she not only believes in her heart but preaches, um, is who I wanted you guys to hear from. Because there's something about examining that we need to do more of, looking inside ourselves and finding out, are we truly walking our own path or a path for someone else? And so I want you guys to hear what she's saying as we talk about authenticity, genuine, being genuine. Uh, originality, authoritativeness, and what it means to be authentic, and how there are misconceptions about authenticity. And we, we run the gamut in the conversation that we have, and it's a lot of fun, and I think you'll enjoy it. So check it out. Hi, I'm Erin Hetzacostas, and you're listening to Chasing Dreams with Amy J. Erin, welcome to the show. I am so excited to, to be here, and selfishly, just to be with you for a little bit, Amy. I miss you. I, you know, it's been almost, you realize we're coming up to a year since oh, we yeah. first met? We met in September, right? We did. Yeah. It's crazy. And so, guys, whenever you go to a setting and you are in an environment of strangers, the thing about where Aaron and I met, um, we have similar coaches in the same program, and we kind of just kind of connected yeah. with each other. And it was just through commonalities of what we were trying to do and the mission you had of be authentic and what you're doing was just resonated with me. And I didn't realize why it resonated me until after that, that workshop that we were in, but um, I could see it. And it's such an amazing story of what you're doing. And one of the reasons I wanted you on the show, Erin, is because you're being authentic. Well, what you just said to me, when you said, because I could see it, mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Now, first of all, I did not plan to look like crap on this thing. That was not intended. I <laughs> said it was a video interview, but first of all, I'm wearing my air supply shirt, which you probably remember. I, I wore. You wore it on like the second day. I know. I do have other clothes, but <laughs> what you just said is, oh my gosh, makes my day because when I talk about authenticity and it took me a while to get there, I wasn't there in September myself. I realized that actually the words I say really don't matter that much. It's what I demonstrate, mm -hmm. right? When you talk about something like authenticity, like blah, 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 I can say all these great words and I'll do that today. But at the end of the day, the thing that really inspires and motivates people is that they see you demonstrating it. So, but thank yeah, you. it's, it's the idea, right? The concept of not does, only does she walk the talk, the talk, she walks the walk. Yeah. And, and you did that. And then, so I, you kind of set up the next question, which was, were you always, trying to be authentic like were you always authentic or is this a, a new skill you've learned you know when I finally traced my roots because again I had not so I had not heard this word authentic like attached to me until actually I retired from my corporate job and it was just like this common thread so it's a word I knew but it wasn't something that like people were saying to me all along and so as I left, and, and quite frankly, I didn't even start Be Authentic Inc. right away. I did something else, right? And so it was sort of this divine intervention that, you know, when you give yourself the space and the grace to stumble and figure out, it comes about. But when I finally kind of did the archaeology on it, I realized that the main thing that shaped me was my father. 
And I, I actually always knew that from a DNA perspective, like I've always had kind of my dad's personality, like we've just always said that, like, you know, I'm more like my dad, maybe than my mom. But what I what I didn't realize is my dad, he was a teacher. And he used to come home from school every night and he, he would get home after my mom did. She was also a teacher, but he, he taught further away and he would sit at the counter while she was making dinner and he had his like one beer. And, you know, I think most people that would probably come home and spend most of their time bitching and moaning about like, you know, the bad things that happened. But most of what my dad would do would sort of brag on all these funny stories of this like crazy stuff he did as a teacher, you know, and he would tell stories about, you know, putting on a James Taylor song and just writing on the board, um, I'm a blank, I'm a blank, I'm a blank. It was steamroller. And, you know, he, he would, you know, do this listening test and all of his math students are like, what the hell? And he would tell story after story after story about him just being a little bit different and unique and unexpected. And I knew he had success, right? So mm -hmm. it wasn't just that he was that way. I knew that it led to him being a beloved teacher, a beloved colleague. And so I think what he gave me, and I want to give others, is like the permission that not only, I always like say, not only just to be authentic, but that it will get you great results. And, and actually where I've gotten to is it's not even just about a passive being authentic. It's actually about strategically using authenticity to your advantage. And that's, you know, that's, you know, it may seem like an oxymoron, but it's not. And it's really understanding the components that make up authenticity and then consciously saying, I'm going to use that to create better connections, to create better followers, uh, to create greater success. And the thing about what you're saying is I think people, people struggle with that concept of authenticity, right? Mm -hmm. They feel that who they are and what they're showing is authentic, right? What do you mean? I, I don't know how to be fake. But I think there's a level of um, reflection that we don't do for ourselves, that we don't realize until we take time to think about it. And so how did you start to do that? Well, first of all, I want to say something. So when people think about authenticity, and not that I want to get into this like dissertation on what it means, mm -hmm. but I think there's a lot of misconception. And I you know, a lot of people sort of, first of all, think it just equals transparency. You know, I get a lot of people to say, well, are you worried if you're authentic and if you're an authentic leader that you'll scare your employees because you're, you know, you're sort of puking out everything. Um, and also, I think sometimes people can confuse it with just being, um, just not caring and just going about your day. And actually, I'm um, working on my first book. And I'll admit, the first time I actually really dove into the definition while I was working on the book, and of course, I married a Greek, so I'm a Greek family. I went right to the Greek origin. And the Greek origin of the word is authentikos, which actually means genuine, original, and authoritative. Mm. And so, it, and it really aligned with my thought that it's actually kind of this juxtaposition between, you know, being your, yourself and being a badass. Like, that's not about just being sort of passive. And so, you know, I really like to to challenge people to sort of dig deeper into what that means to be authentic because I think then and only then can they understand that like it can be used like I hate to say it but as really a weapon as well well I think you're right on the nose I think especially we don't realize right um a lot of the things and who we become are shaped by the opinions of others by the things we learn by experiences that we have and sometimes they're shaping us to be not necessarily the person we would want to be if we took some time to look at ourselves. Yeah. And so, right. And, and so um, for me, one of the things I've realized in the story we've had when we first met and I shared it and the whole room, I think you included, were like, why wouldn't you tell people you used to work at NASA? And I was like, oh, um, yeah, I, I, I did. I was a computer engineer. That was that was a thing. And you, you either gloss over parts of your life and experiences or you are in denial about some of the things that happen. And it's only because of those experiences that I realize how much I let others influence the decisions I made. Like the, the great thing about um, Brand Builders Group and, and who I work with and, and Aaron works with is you start to think. You start to think and give time to yourself that you just don't realize. And so... For you, as you're working with these people and you're working with different individuals, 
what is the struggle or the hard the the hurdle they have to go through in being authentic? Yeah, I mean, I would say the first thing that's a common thread is the first thing is the sucky songs, I call them, that they're telling to themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the limiting beliefs. It's the it's the things to your point that are probably deep rooted in some incident, some person, some negative situation. Um, Usually not completely jumped up on their own. There's something that sort of shaped them. And I think that's the first one. You know, we're especially as women have the same bullshit for like 30 years of like how do you rise, right? Um, you have to network, you have to lean in, you have to have executive presence. It's like all these things that in our minds um, make sense, but don't feel right. And so a lot of what I do first is I, I dig into what are those sucky songs you're singing. And how do we either get rid of them or basically say they're a great song? Um, and, you know, I think the, the biggest thing is making sure they understand that they can not just inspire themselves or people under them, but they can actually inspire people of them. So a lot of what holds people back is, well, I can't be authentic because my boss isn't or my boss is mm -hmm. boss or somewhere in sort of their chain of command. And... Yeah, I mean, there are some people that are just going to be jerks their entire lives. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, whether it's their boss, it's their spouse, um, their friends, you know, I say that part of the reason that they don't get it and they are who, who, because nobody's inspired them yet. And that inspiration is not something that just comes from top down. You know, I, when I was leading my company, I still had bosses, right? So I was in a larger enterprise, even though I was CEO of this company. And let me tell you, most of my inspiration did not come up from a book. It came from the people within my organization. They inspired me in many, many ways. And so I think that's the other thing is really teaching them that it, it's not a, a river that one runs in one direction and that by them starting to act differently and be more authentic and work and bring a different energy, there is a likely chance that they're actually going to inspire those in, a, in the places of influence as well. I love how you say that, how inspiration doesn't necessarily come from above. It could come from a number of sources. And I think sometimes we're so busy looking in one direction, we forget that there's, that change is around us. Totally. In a well, number especially of in a time like this, like I've talked a lot about with COVID and stuff, your bosses are real humans, right? Mm -hmm. they, they, A, don't know any more answers than you do, especially when this thing first started. They have families and, you know, whether that's parents, they're worried about kids. Um and now more than ever is an incredible time in this time of unrest and change and everything that's going on in the world. Like what a great time to take this stance that you actually can lead and inspire people all around you, not just those that may be in a, you know, a position. Yeah. I'm glad you said fear because I think sometimes fear holds us back from a lot of things, right? Not just fear of rejection or fear of failure, but fear of success can also hold us back, right? What will I do if it actually does work? And I think, you know, this time of COVID, um, at the time of this, we're, we're recording it during COVID and it's still happening and slowly the world is opening back up. But, you know, I think we realize, if nothing else, that we're all connected and that we're all human beings, right? I mean, I've been on... Uh, meeting calls where I'm like, look at, look at my boss, all relaxed, no tie in a home. And I'm just like, he's a human being just like me. And it's, it's bringing out these realizations, I guess, well, right? COVID has had a tailwind for authenticity, mm -hmm. 100%, whether it's seeing your boss and, you know, not in their shirt and tie or seeing their kids run in or, you know, seeing the late night shows with, you know, from their homes, like the bar has been lowered. And in fact, you know, it's funny when I got on here, I haven't even showered and stuff. And I thought I've also had conversations, maybe not recorded that are going to go on YouTube where, you know, somebody's like, you look really good today. And you, and I'm like, I felt guilty. Like, you know, I felt like kind of a poser, right? Like, Oh, who am I to take a shower and wear a top? That's not, you know, an air supply t-shirt or a, a running shirt. And so I think, the the tailwinds have been there the challenge will be 
keeping that environment, right? And that's mm-hmm. the challenge with COVID just in general. You know, how do you keep the good and not slip back to the bad? Like, how do you sift through the sand and get that? But it's interesting. I mean, I've, I've read some articles recently, too. I want to talk about, um, you know, some people, there's been some articles published in the New York Times about women, this is on them. They're more often, you know, playing that juggle role and how many of them won't be able to come back to work. And, and that, I'm sure, is a real issue for some women. Sure. At the same time, I feel like, and, and again, Be Authentic Inc. is gender neutral. Authenticity is gender neutral, but I call it sort of advantage women. Because I think that, you know, the main reason women are sort of opting down or opting out is because they're fearing they're going to have to compromise everything else, right, to, to your point. And the, the thing is there are also some tailwinds that are going to really help women. Like, I think about when I was um, CEO and, you know, my peers were all jumping on planes and having steaks and martinis mm-hmm. and doing deals. And I was very picky with my travel. Certainly I traveled, but... I, nothing more than I had to. I'd see the customers when I had to. I'd go out to our offices when I had to. The number of like just killer connections I've made over Zoom over the last three or four months without having to jump on a plane or even go to a restaurant. And trust me, I miss all that stuff, right? I miss being able to like hug somebody and have a drink. But there are also things, whether it's just being able to be more authentic, to be okay if your kids come running in, to be able to do a business deal over zoom instead of having to to fly to LA and, you know, have steaks and martinis. Um, I also really encourage women to, and everyone to embrace some of these things because the speed at which you can connect in this world, even though we're physically apart, you know, especially with video uh, and just the barrier that's been dropped to adopting that is huge. Oh, absolutely. Hands down. And actually you, you bring a good point about when, um, or a point that I want to talk about, about how um, everyone should kind of take a moment to, to think about this and look at this. And so I guess my question is, it's not easy, right? In this, in this changing times, we're also talking during the times of uh, the aftermath of, and death of George Floyd, right? Yeah. And, and the realities yeah. of that and racism in America and the things that are happening and how, you know, I've realized that there are people I know who have a different mentality and mindset. And so in, it's interesting because, you know, change can only happen if you want it to change, right, within ourselves. It doesn't really work unless you're open to it. And so when we're talking about authenticity and trying to be open to new mindsets, new ways of thinking, new uh, experiences, so, so to speak, or just the reality that we aren't authentic, and maybe we are in one area and not in another, wh- how do you talk to those people? How do you talk to people who may just be kind of against it, but probably have come to you and said, hey, I want to do it, but self-reflection isn't me. Yeah, I mean, so first of all, I would say, so I have sort of a uh, six component, I call it humans, is the framework that I, where I talk about authenticity, and the A is adapt. Mm. And it adapt, adapt actually has three parts, and the first part of that is that you have to plug into other people's authenticity. So authenticity is something you should throw out the window and in the garbage if you don't understand that you also have to plug. So the analogy I use is like you can't hop on a plane, fly to Paris, wake up the next morning, plug in your blow dryer and curling iron and expect to walk out looking beautiful, right? Like they have different plugs, like it just doesn't work. And that's the same with authenticity. And as I think about um, everything that's going on, I mean, first of all, first and foremost, like you have to plug into others. Um, you know, for me, that also means unplugging myself a little bit. Um, I've, I've personally, even just in the last week, since I recorded a podcast last week, I'm like, holy crap, you're ignorant. Like I just wrote a blog post today where I finally realized, like, just stop. Like, I always want to try to solve problems. I want to get right into the discussion. And what I learned is I can't erase 45 years of being behind and being ignorant and being, you know, born and raised in a highly uh, non-diverse area. Mm-hmm. So I really said to myself, if you're going to be able to plug into other people's authenticity and understand what's going on, like you need to just slow down, shut up and listen uh, and, and educate. And so, so that's, that's point number one. I mean, you have to plug into other people's authenticity. This, otherwise the, the whole thing falls apart. The other key point is that your authenticity is changing all the time. You know, it, it was interesting. I interviewed somebody a month ago, um, and he has a book 
uh, that's called personality isn't permanent. And, you know, part of what he talks about, it's not the whole thing, is he really disses on, you know, Myers-Briggs, Enneagrams, all these personality things because um, it really pigeonholes people, right? And, and I can see both points. It's very helpful to understand, you know, why you do certain things that drive yourself crazy or other people crazy. At the same time, it can really limit. If you think you're an Enneagram too, and you're not a visionary, for example, or something, you're always helping people, like you may shy away from big things. And so as I think about authenticity, I mean, essentially, authenticity is always changing, and it's called growth. Um, and so, you know, and growth, I, you know, really discomfort is at the heart of that, right? It, it, development demands discomfort. And that's part of the time we're in. If we're going to grow, we have to get uncomfortable. We have to stop and listen. We have to adapt. Um, and it doesn't mean that we're going to be somebody we shouldn't. It's just that we're going to, we're always, like we're never done. Like we're never done figuring out who we are. Um, yeah. You never should be. It's evolution, right? I mean, it, that's how we grow. And your analogy of the fact that it's um, in discomfort that we grow the best is, is accurate. I mean, I actually really love your analogy about, you know, going from here to France and then not thinking that we could just plug in and it's going to be the same. Because I think oftentimes we have our own preset conceptions of what someone's authenticity should be without asking them first. Right. We put this frame, this adapter and filter on them and are like, hey, this is who you are. And that's not right. We have to take a step back. It's a big part of the problem we have. Yeah, Absolutely. we're just not used to it. We're not, not, it's not something we do consciously. And I think, and this isn't uh, any one group of people. Everybody has this issue, right? We all do this where we assume that someone is something. Yeah. And it's like you said, it's like going to another country and expecting the, the plug to fit in without an adapter. But you're not right. going to get that adapter until you talk to them. And ask questions. Ask and I think questions. that's part of the epidemic and... Um, we just, we've never been trained to spend as much brain power on the questions as the thoughts that come out of our mouth. And if you can change your perspective and actually say, okay, I'm going to actually even spend more time in, in you as a podcast host for many, many years, right? Like this, this is part of your training, yeah. uh, not just as a host, but I'm sure it bleeds into your everyday life. And I know it does. Cause I remember when I met you, like you were just somebody that, um, immediately felt this connection and usually that connection comes because somebody asks the right questions it's not superficial and so that's the journey i've been on it's something i was really shitty at doing five years ago it was really through leadership and now as not just a podcast host but as a human being that is really becoming more curious um i like to spend a lot more time thinking about the questions than i ever have let me ask you, when you're trying to figure out what your authenticity is, mm. how do you answer that question? Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, I think that there are a couple of ways that you can tackle that. You know, first of all is to think through all of the things that people come to you and say about you, right? Like, oh, Amy, you're, you know, you're so caring or you're so... You, you always have the best jokes when I'm feeling like when the situations are really heavy, you know, a lot of times who you are comes in sort of those comments and the questions and people, yeah. I think it also comes back to a lot to your family life when you're growing up as you think about um, not just my father's story about how I sort of had this, um, this inspiration that it was okay to be different. And in fact, if you were different, you would get these great results. But, like, what are the core values? What are the things that have shaped you? Um, and then, you know, it gets very, very complicated and very deep as you think about what is your ultimate authentic life? What should you do? What's your purpose? What's yeah. So I talk about it in terms of ikigai. So ikigai is a Japanese term uh, that's best described as the most beautiful Venn diagram of four circles. And the first circle is what you're good at. Okay. The second circle is what you love to do. The third circle is what the world needs. And the fourth circle is what you can get paid for or rewarded for. And um, it, actually, I, I delivered a two-day seminar workshop, growth shop with my former nanny um, just last month where we spent like the last five months really curating 
that agenda. And I will tell you, most of the time that we spent with this group for the two days we were together, we're asking them thoughtful questions. So it was questions like, what are people always coming to you for? What breaks your heart? What's your best day? You know, what do you say when you're like, when I'm 65 and retire, I'll what? And so really understanding who you are, most of all, takes space, takes thought, and takes questions. It so does. I mean, I think uh, it was really only at 28 that I started asking those questions. When I realized I had my own epiphany that, I wasn't necessarily happy with what I was doing. And then I only realized, you know, taking that space and time to see, hey, I've been influenced maybe more than I thought I was. And let me pivot. And, you know, pivoting. Um, for me, it's interesting. Being authentic doesn't mean I've suddenly become a millionaire or I've suddenly gotten every job I want or, you know, everything's aligned now. But what it does mean is, I'm happier than I've ever been. That's been an interesting change because I thought, you know, being authentic meant all the stars align and now you'll be rich because that's what happens on TV and in movies and therefore that's what will happen. But it hasn't happened that way, but it didn't matter. And so what is your experience with now being authentic yourself, but also in seeing what has happened to people you've helped in being authentic? What, what's for those who don't know? Yeah, so I'll say a couple things. So first of all, like, yes, I am following this, and I'll say new authentic path. What I did for the first time in my career was nothing I would ever throw away. That's actually the foundation of mm -hmm. this phase. Um, am I, I am making exponentially less than I did before right now. But mm -hmm. let me be clear, that's not the plan. The plan is to have and, because I believe in the and. Uh, and I actually believe if you have enough patience, you have the right coaches and guidance uh, and your you know, persistence, which comes with patience, if you figure out those first three circles, you absolutely can make this the fourth circle abundant. And I actually, like the message I'd like to give to people, I think that there is a myth that there is an anti-correlation with doing what you love and making mm. money. Right? It's like, oh, which one do I want to pick? Do I want to be fulfilled and smiling every day? Or do I want to be able to pay the bills? Right? Because that's where that's the sucky song that everybody says. I'd love to do what you're doing, Aaron, but well, I have a kid going into college. Mm -hmm. I have to, you know, I have this, I have that. And one hundred percent I am a thousand times happy. I'm so happy I did what I did. But part of it was that I had savings, I had a buffer. Um, I also have people and extenders that I know have had success. And so I am confident in that bridge, right? Yeah. And so I would say to your audience, like, take that sucky song and, like, turn it off because the two actually can be very correlated. And that's, that's where, though, you have to find those mentors, those coaches, the programs, like, we're part of that teach you how to do that. And you also have to understand it's not going to come overnight. You know what? If it came overnight, Everybody, everybody would, would do be it. doing it, yeah. right? Every, everybody would be doing it, and then you'd be lost in the sea. And so you're doing that thing that you're supposed to do, that you love, that is like literally tapped into the gem, the one gem that sits within you that, you know, out of 7 billion people, you're the first person supposed to do it. I'm telling you, you can have the end. You can have happiness that is rich, and then you can have riches. And I, I love how you say that because, like, I, I am happy now. I don't have that, you know, all the stars align. But I think I'm on that path, right? I think yeah. it's a better path. It's a rockier path. There's more hills. There's more valleys, et cetera. But I don't regret the path. And I think people at the end of their life, unfortunately, look back and they think, I wish. And I don't think I can say that. And yeah. so, Aaron, with the work that you do, um, a lot of people have regrets and they think it's too late, right? Because mm. ageism is a thing and people, for whatever reason, buy into it. It is what it is. Some are young and think it's too late. I've already kind of set myself on my career and I can't change. It's, there's no pivot available. Then there are others who are elderly or, or mid-age or whatever you want to describe it who are like, I've, I've dedicated my whole life to this. How could I change now? Yeah. And so what do they do? 
Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, you know, age is all relative. Like, I'm no spring chicken. I, you know, I started this when I was 44. I'm soon to be 46. Like, holy crap. Um, what I would say, it reminds me of what I also tell people, which is another problem people have, is where it's not just the age. Part of the thing I think that holds people back is like, okay, I'm going to start doing this. I've seen others that are doing it, whether mm -hmm. it's being a speaker, starting your own coffee shop, but you, you name it. Um, and they have what I call this comparison cramp, right, where it's just like, it sounds great, and then immediately what do you do? You compare yourself, and, and, and you know, if you're 60-some years old and you're watching this, you want to be a, a public speaker, you're watching this 30-year-old whippersnapper, like the first thing you think is, it's too late, not because it's too late for you. You might think I got solid 20, 30 years left in me, mm -hmm. but because I'm too late. And I remember I was running, so I, I'm a runner, you know, run half marathons here and there. I was running one last year and it was about my fourth. So, you know, at that point, like I was used to running a half marathon and I knew what, what you do when you run for 13 miles is you have a lot of crap that you notice that you wish you wouldn't know. And, and one thing you notice is like, how many people am I passing versus being passed? Right. Yeah. And in this race, for some reason, I started out where I should have. So meaning I didn't start like, you know, at a, at a, you know, eight minute mile pace. And that's why everybody was passing me. I started kind of like where I should have. But for some reason in this race, more people were passing me than, than I felt like I usually did. And I felt good. Like I actually was, I've had races I didn't, like I did one last fall, it didn't feel good. But I really felt strong. And but the whole time, it's kind of like, you got me down, and I was curious, like, why are so many people passing me? So I get done with the race, and I had two other friends running, so I get my water, and I still circle back around uh, to wait to cheer them on. And I'm standing there, and I'm like, holy crap. Like, all of these people were behind me? And intellectually, I knew it. I knew that I ran better than, you know, so previously more than half of the group. You sit there and you're like, oh my gosh, and you just keep, they keep coming and they keep coming wow. and they keep coming. And I think that's, that's exactly what happens in life and your career and yeah. with your friend, and, you know, this, this comparison. And what I tell people is if you're thinking about going and doing something different, yeah, you might have a cramp. You might look at somebody else that already has a great little coffee shop in town or already is doing something. But there are literally probably 7 billion plus people that are behind you. So, like, you picture yourself in your race. It's so easy to see in front of you, of course. Like, that's where our head's going. Yeah. That's easy. That's the easy part. And that, so that's what we all see. Like, we get jealous and it holds us back because we think we're behind. But the reality is if you just do this and turn around for a second, you'd recognize that if you take the step now, if you take the step next week, if you take the step in five years, you're still going to be ahead of so many people. And it's, you know, there's never a right time. Now's the time. Now is the time. I'm going to leave it with that. Now's the time. <laughs> that was a mic drop moment. Um, but before I, well, let we go to the fun stuff, what mm -hmm. is one thing you would tell these guys to do today to chase their dreams? Because a lot of great advice. What is one thing that you would tell them? Get curious. Curiosity mm -hmm. is the best thing ever. And, you know, I'm sure you can relate with this, Amy, like we're in new industries. We're not doing what we did before. And what happens is if you just get curious on one thing, it's like, it's like this curtain opens up. So let's say, you know, and sometimes that first curiosity step, you have to do something. You have to Google something. You have to find a podcast. You have to take a course. You have to find write. a teacher. Yeah. But as soon as you open that first curtain, just one curtain, what's behind that? Like, then there's a little bit of information, but then it's like very clear. There's the other curtain. And then the next curtain comes and the next curtain comes. And I think so often we try to think about it like, oh, my God, I have to learn all these things. And it's like, no, you just got to keep peeling one curtain back at the time. But you got to start with the first curtain. Dang. That was good. I love it. I Thanks. love it. All right, let's see how you do with this. It's time to get to know you a little bit better, Erin. All right, do it. All right, so we got random questions. All right, it's a weird one. Um course yeah I'm uh, weird. but i'm gonna i'm gonna limit you to yeah. a minute to answer what law would you make what law would i make oh i would make a law that if you're an a-hole more than three times in a leadership position <laughs> you're fired that's a good one what was that 10 seconds that was 10. yeah i i 
I, did, I thought three, you might have to think about that. I don't know if I can swear, so I'll just say the three a-hole rule. I like it, and I think it should be implemented. Across. Let's put it in with all this COVID stuff. They seem to actually be passing stuff. Maybe we can slide it in. <laughs> Get it in there? See yeah. what we can do? I, I, I support that. The, the three a-hole rule. Yeah, you're out. Appreciate all right. Uh, question number two. Who or what has contributed the most to your value system? Yeah, I mean, that was definitely my parents. Um, to You know, not only my father and sort of teaching me this concept of like doubling down on your authenticity, um, but my mother too is just the kindest, gentlest soul and like a fraction of her. Um, and you know, they always just were okay with my craziness. They knew that even though I was a little bit wild that I had my head mostly turned on and you know just sat back and encouraged me to do whatever I wanted to do and that's you know as parents now as, as me being a parent like it's really not about how many soccer games we take and to and like how good our meals are it's really that we demonstrate what we want to have for them so all the parents listening like don't wait for your kid to go hear some graduation speech that says you know Follow your dreams and take big risks and conquer the world. Like, show them that. Do that yourself. I agree. Don't wait. Don't let other people do what you need to be doing. Yeah. Don't let, yeah. Don't let some complete 18 year old do it. <laughs> Demonstrate it. Show them, show them away. Might even be the wrong one. So, yeah, yeah exactly. Question three What was your best vacation ever? Oh, so gosh, we're really blessed. We've had a lot of good ones, but, um, it's a tie. I mean, we've, we're lucky enough we've go to Greece, uh, been to Greece four times because my husband's family's from there. But you know what? I'm actually going to say my family, who lives in Michigan, so I don't see them that often, my parents, my brother, sister-in-law, and my nephews, and all of us went on a cruise this year, wait for it, from March 8th to March 15th, like when the world was shutting down. And, and it was were like- you stuck? No, we didn't get stuck. It was literally the last day that the cruise ships would not let you get out of it. They gave mm. you all of your money. My parents had been planning it for years, and we, we we walked onto that ship. We got our temperatures taken, and it, you know, I tell people, I'm like, and it was wonderful, right? A cruise is just wonderful, and being with my family and my nephews and, and my kids are like at that age, so where they're just they don't get to see each other much, right. so they were just like this. Um, and I said. Yeah, it was a little ominous because, you know, every day we'd come back to our cab and they'd be like, oh, the NBA is shutting down. We're like, oh, my God. But um, when you, like, when you're drunk by 11 on some beach, like, <laughs> you also, like, take all the cares away. So it was a pretty special vacation. And, of course, we're, we're counting our blessings. We all came back healthy and, and safe. It's definitely memorable. Very Greece memorable. is a bucket list. Greece is my bucket list. Yeah. Oh, gosh, you have to go. Um, if you were able to go on the space shuttle for one month, would you go? No. No, too claustrophobic. Too mm, that would do it. Scary. Um, God bless the people that do it, but I'm not the first one to sign up. Yeah, I'd be like that. Uh, last question. Yeah. Which childhood friend would you like to reconnect with? Oh, which child, right? It's such a different world. We're at least connected on Facebook and stuff. That's a great question. School friend, high school. Oh, elementary uh, yeah I mean I had um I had a friend Kelly that I really grew up with and I see her maybe once a year when I get home um but it would be nice to be able to have some more time and I think now that our kids are getting a little bit older and things like that um Hopefully next time I'm home, we'll have a little more time to just finally strip away all the madness that we've dealt with over the last 20 years. We're just a little older and, nice. and just be childhood friends again. That sounds awesome. Erin, yeah. thank you so much for coming on the show. Is there, these guys want to connect with you, which you should, how can they do so? Yeah, and you won't recognize me in my pictures because I actually showered uh, on my you know, website. But yeah, I mean, check out um, the company's Be Authentic Inc. It's just the letter B. We got to be a little bit sassy. Be authentic inc.com. Uh, I am also some version of that on Instagram. Be underscore authentic underscore inc. 
on Instagram. Uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, Erin Hatsapastas. I'm very active there. I also have Facebook, The Authentic Inc. And then if you want to check out our podcast, so I co-host a podcast that is complete reality, complete shit show, and it's all about, um, it's career advice, but done kind of in a really offbeat way. So join Nicole and I on, it's called B, just the letter B, because, C-A-U-S-E podcast. So you can find all that on the website as well. So, so Guys, good. check it out. And as soon as our book drops, I'll be letting you know. Don't even think I won't tell you. Oh, I mean, great. you can hear from her first, but I'll tell you too. So awesome. do that. Any last words, Erin? You know what? Just go out there and shake up the world. You know, be authentic and remember, be, you know, it's it, it's about a being a little bit kind, but it's also about being a little bit badass. And let, let's just change the world one person at a time. Couldn't have said it better myself. Erin, thank you again. Guys, do check it out. Check out Connect. She's awesome to follow. Great friend. I appreciate you. I appreciate you too, Amy. So, guys, that was Erin Hatsakostas. Friend, authenticity preacher, uh, all around cool gal. Isn't she fantastic? And so there's a lot of takeaways from this. One of the biggest ones that I want you guys to take away from this is reflection. I want you to look inside yourself and, you know, get curious. You know, she said, get curious about one thing. I want you to get curious about yourself. That's what I want you to do. I want, you know, I believe there are 10 areas of wellness, areas of life that um, a person has to look into. And that includes uh, your physical health, your mental health, I'm trying to pull it all up, physical health, mental health, financial, spiritual, your familial, friendship, partnership, relationships kind of thing, um, recreation, what do you do in your free time, your hobbies, your interests, walk of life. Some of us have careers, some of us have callings, you know, what, however you want to call it, what's your walk of life, and personal growth. Those are 10 areas I want you to get curious about, about yourself. Like look and examine and reflect upon yourself and what's happening in that area. And ask yourself, you know, am I authentic in how I feel here? And if not, what can you do about it? And, you know, we're going to find more and more ways to kind of reflect, analyze, and improve upon ourselves and grow. But reflecting giving ourselves the grace to think that there might be something we want to change, allowing for that possibility is the first step. So that's what I want you guys to do after this episode. Um, take some time and reflect upon yourself, okay? 20, 30 minutes, I think you owe yourself that. You deserve that time for yourself to do it. It's important. It'll help you. It'll make you a better person. Even if what you find is, yeah, I'm living life authentically in all of these areas. I'm doing what I want to do in all of these areas. And that's cool. That's great. And if not, if you find, hey, you know, I'm not really living authentically recreationally, right? I, I've always wanted to swim. That was something I wasn't doing because I just didn't think I could. And so when I started swimming, life changed. I I'm so passionate about it that this COVID thing is a, such a bummer because I can't swim right now. But when I brought swimming into my life, when I kind of reflected upon myself and realized, hey, I can't do some of these things. I'm, I'm trying to work out and it's not really my thing. I want to try swimming. That was the game changer for me. What's the game changer for you, right? Take some time, think about it, see what you can do. And if you don't remember some of the things that we said, if you want to learn more about Aaron, Check out the show notes. It's all there. You can find it at amyj21.com slash episode 227. That's episode 227. All right, guys, until next time, remember, don't stop. Keep chasing.